Today I'm going to talk about the wave function and Schrodinger's equation. Now we've seen some persuasive evidence that on an atomic or a subatomic scale, a particle for instance such as the electron cannot be described simply as a point. So instead we need to use the wave function to describe the state of the particle. Now what do we mean exactly by that? The symbol that is normally used for the wave function is the Greek letter Psi. We could also use this one here, which is just the smaller, the lowercase Psi. Now the uppercase is normally a function of both space and time. So let's say that this first one is a function of X, Y, Z and T, whereas the lowercase one, the convention is that this is typically just a function of the spatial coordinates. The whole idea of quantum mechanics is to use this quantity, which is the wave function, to determine the average quantities of the particles. Now, what are the quantities of the particles? For, in for instance, we could work out the average position we could work out the average velocity, we could work out the average momentum, energy, or angular momentum. Notice that I'm saying the word average because this distribution will be key in quantum mechanics. The idea of a wave function is not exactly new. For instance, in electromagnetism, the intensity of a wave is actually proportional to the square of the amplitude of the electric field. And this actually means that the square of the electric field magnitude, which is essentially the amplitude, is proportional to the probability of finding a photon at a particular point. Now, in exactly the same wave, the square of the wave function of the particle tells us the probability of finding the particle around that point. A little bit more precisely, though, we need to say that we need to take the absolute value of the wave function. So what we can say is that we need to take the uh, square of the magnitude. This is necessary because, as we're going to see later, Psi, the wave function, may be a complex quantity. In fact, uh, in most of the cases, it is a complex quantity. And for a particle which is moving in three dimensions, so the quantity, let's say, uh, Psi, which is a function of X, Y, Z, and t and then squared multiplied by a tiny volume dv is the probability that the particle will be found at time t within that volume dv which is just around the point let's say that this here is the point x y z and there's a tiny uh, volume dv which is let's say around that point the particle is most likely to be found there. This is the first uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics made by the German physicist Max de Born, but it requires the wave function to be normalized. Now, what do I mean by the wave function being normalized? It means that if I take the square of the amplitude and integrate it over the whole of space, so let's say I integrate psi, squared dv uh, from let's say from minus infinity to infinity then this will always have to equal one and this is our normalization condition in other words the probability is exactly one that the particle is somewhere in the universe in order to describe a particle, we need to know its wave function and its energy. In order to figure those out, we use a tool which was first developed in 1926 by Erwin Schrödinger and is known as the Schrödinger equation. And here you have it in all of its glory. This equation plays the same central role in quantum mechanics as do Newton's laws in mechanics and Maxwell's equations in electromagnetism. In fact, our understanding of every quantum mechanical system, including atoms, molecules, nuclei, solids, semiconductors, etc., is based on solutions 
solutions of this equation. We cannot derive Schrodinger's equation from other principles. It is a principle of its own. Here we have Schrodinger's equation in its simplest forms, and uh, this is an equation for a particle of mass m that is moving in one dimension only, parallel, let's say, to the x axis. So that the spatial wave function psi is a function of x only. We assume that the particle moves in the presence of a force which only has an x component and therefore there is a corresponding potential energy ux. Notice that it's a second order differential equation with, uh, with respect to, to x and this is equal to the energy of the particle multiplied by the wave function. Now if you cannot derive it you may be wondering how does this equation work. The simple answer is that it agrees with every single experiment that has ever been made. Okay, well, in general, the left-hand side of this equation is representative of the kinetic energy, and the right-hand side of this equation is representative of the potential energy. And if you think about it, potential energy plus the kinetic energy is going to give us the total energy. Now, how can you actually solve it? So, let's have a look at a case for a free particle. So, if I'm dealing with a free particle, I'm going to set my potential u of x to be equal to zero. Before we go on to solving this equation, I would like to remind you of a couple of relationships in physics. First off, the kinetic energy of a particle can be expressed as p squared over to m. Remember that the um, momentum of a particle can be expressed as mv and if we just square that and we divide it by 2m what we're going to get is m squared v squared over 2m which is of course equal to a half mv squared which is equal to our kinetic energy. The next relationship that I'd like to remind you is that the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant h divided by p. Now in quantum mechanics we often use h-bar, as you can see we have this constant h-bar over here in Schrodinger's equation, and uh, this is simply defined as Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Now, why is this very, very useful in quantum mechanics? Um, if you've studied other forms of mechanics, for instance, electromagnetism or just wave theory in general, you would have come across the concept of a wave number. So the wave number is typically given the, um, the letter k and is simply 2 pi radians divided by the wavelength. So how many wavelengths are actually contained and hence it's called the wave number. We can do a little mathematical trick and what we can do is uh, we can just simply multiply this by h, so 2 pi times h. We can also divide it by h and um, we also have a lambda over here. What we're simply left with is actually the momentum divided by h bar. Now how did I get that? Remember if lambda is equal to h over p this of course means that my momentum will be equal to h over lambda. So this means that this expression here has got to be equal to this expression over here. And 2 pi over h, well that's just the inverse of um, h over 2 pi. So this means that the wave number is equal to the momentum divided by h bar. Let me also remind you a very, very important fact in mathematics. So if we're looking at complex number, we could have defined the number i to be equal to the square root of minus 1. It still amazes me that this groundbreaking idea in mathematics simply invented to solve any problem in algebra turns out to be a fundamental um, part of nature, a fundamental part of Schrodinger's equation. However, let's go back to actually solving it. 
So if i is equal to the square root of minus 1, then by definition, i squared will be equal to the square root of minus 1 times the square root of minus 1, uh, which is, of course, just equal to minus 1. Now, this is critical because when I'm guessing a function that satisfies a Schrodinger's equation, I'm going to need a function that, when differentiated, will give me a negative value compared to the uh, function in itself. So let's try and solve this equation. First off, u of x is equal to zero, so we can ignore this term. Schrodinger's equation for a free particle then becomes minus uh, h bar squared over 2m, then the second derivative of this function is equal to a multiple of um, e times the function itself. Well, as is often the case with differential equations, let's do an educated guess for the wave function. What I'm going to do is I'm going to guess that my function, which is a function of x, uh, psi of x, let's say that this is equal to some constant, which I don't know yet, multiplied by e raised to the power of i k x. Now, k here is the wave number, i is just the imaginary number, the imaginary unit number, x is just the spatial coordinate. So let's just substitute this into the left-hand side of Schrodinger's equation. So what I'm going to do is essentially I'm just going to say that minus h bar squared over 2m and I'm going to find the second derivative of this function a to the e to the i k x and that's divided by dx squared. Now plus zero, which I'm not going to write, is of course equal to the energy times a uh, e to the i k x. Okay, now all we need to do really is just differentiate this function using the chain rule. If you don't remember the chain rule, I have a separate video on uh, on that. I'll link this into the uh, description. So the second derivative of this function is just the same function multiplied by a factor of i squared times a factor of k squared. So let's just write this down. So minus h bar squared over 2m multiplied by, let's, let's put some brackets here, i k squared, multiplied by our original function, which is just a to the uh, e to the i k x, will be equal to the energy multiplied by the original wave function that we have guessed. So what we can do is uh, just do a little bit of tidying up. So the minus sign here will essentially be uh, taken care of by this factor of i squared just here. So the two are just going to be cancelling each other out, essentially. And if we do a little bit of uh, maps, what we are left with is simply h bar squared k squared divided by 2m multiplied by a times our original exponential, which is e to the i k x. And this, of course, is equal to e a e to the i k x. Now, here's something really, really interesting. Now, h bar squared k squared, this really reminds me of the momentum equation. And um, in fact, I know that k is equal to p over h bar. So I can essentially just substitute this back directly into my solution attempt at Schrodinger's equation. And what I'm going to get is h bar squared. Now rather than k squared, what I'm going to write is p squared over h bar squared, like that, divided by 2m a e to the i k x is equal to e a e to the i k x. Now the h bars can cancel out, so we can cancel this. And what we're left with is that p squared over 2m multiplied by our proposed uh, solution for the for the wave function, um, let's say e to the i k x with a constant of uh, 
of a in front is equal to e times a e to the i k x. Now what this means is exactly what we actually expected, that the kinetic energy, that the only energy in this case is just the kinetic energy, which is given by the good old expression p squared over 2m for a free particle. Think about this, guys. We've actually used Schrodinger's equation to show that for a free particle with no potential, so there's no force acting on it, the particle is happy and free, the kinetic energy or the total energy is equal to p squared over 2m, which is just the kinetic energy. Okay, guys, well, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you found this video useful and I'll see you in the next video in which we're going to be looking at more complicated uh, phenomena using Schrodinger's equation. Really, really interesting stuff.